Well, hello friends, and welcome to another Ask Zach. I hope you're doing well today. Today we are going to talk about uh, my story of the Nashville Flood. So uh, these are tales from the Nashville Flood of 2010. And it's, uh, it's crazy because it, uh, you know, my experience includes, you know, of course, myself and then uh, all sorts of uh, crazy people like, uh, you know, Reggie Young and Joe Glazer and Larry Carlton and Robin Ford and uh, Andy Reese, Jack Pearson, uh, yeah, Brad Paisley, uh, all sorts of, uh, crazy characters show up in this story. So, uh, yeah. And the, re the reason I'm, I'm telling it is that, uh, one, I just hadn't thought about talking about it. And two, we, uh, we, we recently had a, uh, uh, some really bad flooding conditions here in the Nashville area. And including, I had, uh, some homes in my neighborhood were, were flooded, um, and uh, yeah, and then three, we're kind of coming up on the on the anniversary of, of the flood uh, back in in May of 2010. So, all right. So if you've been enjoying the show and you haven't subscribed yet, please go down in the corner. Uh, if you've been enjoying the show, then I appreciate you supporting it because that's what keeps it going. That's what keeps the content coming. So uh, one, you can go down into the description and there's tip jar information. Or you can go to askzack.com and you can find, uh, you know, merch like this uh, T-shirt that's kind of A to Z, Ask Zach, and then it has all these great, you know, JFET, Whammy, uh, Yellow Astron, you know, all these different uh, guitar words in between it. Or you can uh, find out about Friends of Ask Zach, which is a way to support the show on a monthly basis, and I really appreciate everyone that has uh, that has done that or supported me in any way. All right. So the flood. Okay, first of all, we have to get in the Wayback Machine and go all the way back to uh, May of 2010. And at that point, I have a one-year-old son named Luke. And I have, you know, of course, I'm married and still am. Same woman, uh, Amy. And Amy is pregnant with our second child, Molly. Uh, so it had been, uh, you know, kind of a somewhat of a busy week, and I knew that there was a guitar festival that was going to happen. It was going to happen on Saturday, and I knew there was going to be a bunch of vintage guitars there. They were going to have a, a show for that, uh, and then they were going to have a, a, a bunch of performers. They were going to have a bunch of guitar players, you know, Nashville guitar players, going to be playing in some different little, uh, little boutique venue kind of things down there. So I was excited about it, but again... I have a one-year-old son, and I have a pregnant wife, and it's kind of been a little bit of a crazy week. So I was thinking, probably not going to go. Well, it gets to be Saturday morning, and my wife Amy, uh, she has cabin fever. And she said, uh, I want to get out. I want to do something. She said, didn't you want to go to a guitar festival thing down in Leaper's Fork? And I said, yeah, I said, but I was looking at the weather. The weather doesn't look really good. It looks like there could be, you know, some, some minor flooding and there could be a fair amount of rain. She said, I don't care. I want to go. So at that point, it's like, okay, your, your pregnant wife wants to go to a guitar festival. Okay, well, I, I better go then. So we loaded up and we drove down there. So, uh, Leaper's Fork is, is south of Nashville, kind of southwest of it, and it's a very small community. And there's there's one way in, there's kind of one way in from the north and one way in from the south. Um, there are some little side streets, but uh, th there's really not a whole lot there. And there's a, uh, 
you know, a venue restaurant slash grocery store called Puckett's. Uh, and then there's a few other, you know, little, little, you know, kind of venue boutique, uh, antique shops record, you know, little different things through there, but it's not very big. It's a small community. So we drove down there and of course it's raining. So we're coming from the North and we're, we're going down into Leapers Fork and we have to cross this little bridge and we can see there's a lot of cars. So we go ahead and park right after the bridge. This will be important later. We get out and we go to Puckett's. And at Puckett's, there is Jack Pearson, who is probably, if I had to list the greatest, you know, one, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. He's one of the greatest guitar players in the world and one of the greatest guitar players in Nashville. Jack Pearson is so versatile and so amazing. And uh, anyway, he's playing with Andy Reese, who Andy Reese, of course, incredible guitar player who I've interviewed for the True Tone Lounge and he plays with the Time Jumpers and he's done all sorts of stuff in Nashville. Uh, so they're playing and I'm sitting there with my pregnant wife and my one-year-old child and uh, we're, you know, I think I'm, you know, we're having like, you know, BLTs or something like that and we're just kind of drying out a little bit and enjoying the music and of course it's, the music's phenomenal. So after we, we finish eating and we pay, we go next door and next door is an art gallery that's been turned into a guitar showcase by Joe Glazer. So Joe Glazer has pulled all these strings with collectors and, you know, famous musicians in town to, you know, loan him these instruments to have them on display. And he's got armed guards there because there's millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of guitars, you know, priceless instruments. Uh, some of the really rare things where they had a collection of Lloyd Lore signed five series instruments. So there was a Gibson L5 guitar signed by Lore. There was a Gibson F5 mandolin signed by Lore and a, I believe a K5 mandocello and maybe a mandola, but uh, yeah, that was incredibly rare. They had Clapton's Explorer that, that was kind of cut off on the edge there. They had a, a prototype Strat with uh, the handmade uh, little really gnarled looking uh, saddles on it. They had a, you know, broadcaster. They had, uh, Marty Stewart had loaned the Clarence White guitar, you know, with the, the original B-Bender guitar was there. Just all sorts of really cool guitars. And, and Joe was, you know, kind of standing there and talking. And these instruments were not behind glass. They were just on stands on tables. And you weren't allowed to touch anything, but you could get really close and you could kind of look around the back of them and things like that. So it was really, really neat. Uh, you know, was just really enjoying that. Then we decided to go across the street after seeing all the vintage guitars. So uh, across the street, we go into this little boutique and in there is Reggie Young and he has a little band and he's kind of playing his greatest hits. So he's playing like you know, Drift Away and Son of a Preacher Man and like Waylon tunes and Haggard tunes and all sorts of stuff there. And it's just like, it's ridiculous because, you know, there he is with his 69 Tele Custom and he's just, you know, you know, he was still, you know, kind of in his prime as it were and, and uh, playing great. And it, yeah, it was, it was mind blowing seeing, you know, Reggie up close. So then all of a sudden the, you know, we hear some sirens go off, like tornado sirens, and they and they say uh, they said there was a tornado coming through or something, and they they stopped Reggie from playing, and they said everyone had to go down into the basement of this boutique. So we go down into the basement, and you know it's like concrete floor that's kind of torn up, and there's some rebar hanging, and there's you know wires and stuff like that, and there's water dripping, and we can hear you know the rain's coming down really hard outside, and we're kind of stuck there. And again, one year old child, pregnant wife, and me, and so we're stuck down there. And uh, I look at Amy, my wife, uh, and I say, you know what? I think it's time I go get the car, and I think it's time we go home. And she said, Yeah, I think you're right. You know, Luke needs a nap. Um, I think it's time to go home. So, you know, I hadn't gotten to see everything, but I was like, you know, you know, cause there was supposed to be a concert later on with a bunch of, you know, with a bunch of guitar players playing together. But I was like, no, I think I've had enough. So it's raining. I uh, get back on the, on the main road and I start walking down it toward our car. Something tells me run. 
And so I start running toward my car. And then I start hearing rushing water. And so I had parked just south of this bridge. And I look and I can see a wall of water coming toward the bridge. And I run even faster. I get in my car. I put it in reverse so I can back into someone's driveway. And then I, I drive away from the bridge going south. And I look in my rearview mirror and I see the water overtaking the cars on both sides of the road. So if I would have been just 30 seconds a minute later or less, uh, my car would have been covered with water and I wouldn't have been able to, to, to get it. I would have lost my car. So I go down to the gallery, which is, you know, where the vintage guitar show was, because that's where Amy said that she would be with our son. And a sheriff's deputy is there and he helps Amy, you know, and my son get into the car. And we try to go to, you know, the other way out of Leaper's Fork, which is to the south. It dips down. And of course, it's completely covered in water. We can't get out. We're stuck. We're stuck in Leaper's Fork. So I knew there was a rec center there, which is where they were going to have the concert. And I knew it was kind of on higher ground. And so I went over to the rec center and there's a woman there, you know, with a, you know, CB radio and stuff. And, 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 and I'm trying to park the car and she says, no, you can't park here. This is for artists only. And I tell her, lady, you don't understand. It's flooding. There's no way in or out of Leaper's Fork. And she's kind of in shock because she didn't realize this. And so she allows us to park there and we go inside. Now, at this point, we're completely soaked. I mean, we're, we're, our clothes are soaking wet. And we go inside to this rec center and there's a stage set up. And there's nobody playing yet, but there's Larry Carlton and Vince Gill and, you know, all sorts of other guitar players. And there's only about 20 people in the room. You know, there's, and this is, you know, where they were going to have the concert. So there's all these chairs set up, but there's only about 20 people there. And then there's the musicians up there. Well, Amy tells me, look, I'm going to see if I can find a side room or something like that, where I can take Luke and try to get him to rest some because he really needs a nap. Cause he was of course getting really upset. One year old boy needs a nap. So she goes off and then all of a sudden they start playing music. And at first it's just like, you know, there was like one or two guitar players just playing by themselves. But then all of a sudden, Larry Carlton's band starts playing and Larry's playing. There he is with his, you know, 69, 335 and, and, and it's just like, it's amazing, you know? And it's like, there's only like 20 people there. You know, there's this huge, all these chairs everywhere. <laughs> there's only 20 people there and they're playing for us. So I take off, I have an undershirt on. So I take my shirt off and so I can kind of let that dry. And I take my shoes off, my socks off, trying to let, you know, things dry out a little bit while I'm sitting there. Cause there's no one around me anyway. And so I'm just enjoying a little concert of, you know, Larry Carlton and his band, you know, playing. And Larry played uh, like the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know, on his 335 and had him put a bunch of chorus on it and kind of spread it right and left. And, and, uh, and then Robin Ford comes out and Larry and Robin Ford are playing together. And I'm just, my eyes are getting big and, and I'm starting to forget that there's this natural disaster going on, that there's all this flooding and I'm just kind of, you know, watching this and starting to enjoy it. And all of a sudden my wife comes running toward me and she said, get your clothes and your shoes on. There's one way out right now. And she's running toward me, you know, yelling and, and has her, you know, our son that she's holding under her arm. And uh, so I get my, my wet, you know, socks and shoes on and get my shirt back on. And we run outside, we get in the car and that same place to the south where it dips down, it had receded enough to where we could get through. And so she had heard from one of the sheriff's deputies that that spot had receded just enough where a car could get through it. You know, certainly the water came up fairly high on, uh, on the car, you know, up on the wheels, but it, it wasn't, you know, dangerous. So we, uh, we got through and it looked like a war zone. Uh, there were, you know, downed trees and, and cars, you know, that had been, you know, moved by the, the flooding and stuff. And, and it just, it was horrible. And we got on the Natchez Trace and we came all the way up and, and then took some little side roads and we got onto, you know, Interstate 40 
And then uh, we were able to get back home to, uh, to Brentwood where we lived at the time. And, uh, it was scary. It was so scary to have that kind of, you know, water to have almost lost our car to, you know, we thought we were going to be stuck in Leaper's Fork, which some people were. We found out that uh, Vince Gill had just gotten in his car and, and driven back home and, and went in some water that came up, you know, up to his windows on his car and, you know, but made it through. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And so, but it wasn't over yet. That was the thing. So that was just Saturday. So we're, but we're, we're back home safe, but it keeps raining. It just keeps raining. And so we look and there's a little Creek behind our, our, our place in Brentwood. And we watch as the water keeps getting higher and higher and coming into our little backyard. And we look out, you know, we were living in a condo and we look into the parking lot and the parking lot is starting to hold water. We're, we're watching as water is starting to build up in the parking lot. I mean, it just starts getting so scary and we start watching the news and there's all sorts of crazy things going on. Finally, the rain stops on Sunday and, uh, and we thought, oh, you know, it's all, you know, every, everything's going to be okay. Well, it was going to be okay for us, but there was this rehearsal facility and storage area, you know, called Soundcheck and it was right near the Cumberland River. It was very on very low ground, and that was where everyone used to store their equipment. So all the session players, you know, back in the days of Cartage, would store their equipment there, all their guitars and amps, and then you know the the, the Cartage companies would would bring it, deliver it uh, for them to studios. Then that's where every artist stored their stuff. So when I was working for Brad Paisley, he had a big old closet that was full of stuff that he wasn't using. And then he had another area where they would keep his sets and things like that when he wasn't touring. Then also, so that's for, so pretty much every artist in Nashville had their sets, their lighting, their video gear. All the session guitar players had all their guitars and amps and effects and everything there. Um, there were 18 wheelers that were parked there that were full of gear. Um, well, guess what? The water hadn't, you know, the river hadn't crested. And so it came up and it almost completely submerged the sound check building. And so those 18 wheelers were floating and all sorts of human waste, diesel fuel, muck from the water, sewage, all this stuff got in there and got inside of guitars and amps and destroyed all sorts of things. So I heard about this and I called Brad Paisley and I said, look, I know that after the water comes down, you know, you're going to want to go in there and, and start you know, and, and you're going to want to triage things and take things apart and, and see what can be saved. And, and, and I said, I'm, I'm there for you. And he said, great, you know, I'll, I'll tell you when. So I got another call from Brad. So Keith Urban, Vince Gill and Brad Paisley were all, you know, they were some of the first to be let in there after the waters came down. And, uh, Brad said all of his stuff was a total loss. You know, again, because there wasn't much vintage stuff, it was like everything was going to be so expensive to repair that, it, I mean, it was cheaper to buy new things. So, but all of his sets, you know, for the tour that he was about to go on, that was ironically called the H2O tour because he was having a hit with the song Water, uh, was destroyed by the water. It was terrible. And uh, the guy that took my place uh, with Brad as his tech, uh, Chad Weaver, he had the task of, you know, of, of replacing everything. He had to have his rack, his amps, guitars, all sorts of stuff so that they, they could go out on the road. Cause they only had a, you know, a, a couple of weeks until they had to leave. And so he, you know, pretty much, you know, almost killed himself, uh, you know, getting everything replaced and, uh, you know, as far as the session guys, uh, a lot of the session guys told me that, you know, in their closets, there was a, a kind of a marker as far as like in the room, like measurement wise, it's like everything that was below three feet was gone. 
So it had just been in the water too long and it had been submerged too long, but things that were above that uh, had a chance. And so what they had to do on guitars, would they had to take all the hardware off immediately. So they took the tuners, pickups, everything else, and they put them aside and then they put the whole guitar in like a thing of rice or something to let it dry out. And then you just had to let it sit there for, for weeks to a month to see if it could be uh, salvaged. And of course it was very expensive to try to salvage these guitars. So it was pretty much only things that were, you know, irreplaceable, you know, horribly expensive vintage things, but there were so many guitars that were lost. So many, uh, you know, important instruments. Um, Larry Carlton had a, a dumble that was uh, underwater and, uh, you know, they pretty much had to completely rebuild it. And, uh, you know, but just, yeah. You know, Brad lost all of his all of his stuff at the time. Uh, tons of people lost tons of guitars, and it was just a uh, a horrible horrible time. So uh, Soundcheck is still there, and uh, you know I think Fender and Fishman and a couple other you know LR bags have some offices there. You know artist relations type offices, and uh, but there's not as much stuff being stored there as there was, and uh, yeah. It was just a really crazy time in Nashville, and I was uh, very lucky to be uh, safe and okay, and that my, you know, me and my wife and pregnant wife and, and child didn't get hurt or stuck somewhere, and uh, and everything was okay. But uh, yeah, that was the the Nashville flood of uh, 2010. So on a completely different note. I'll do a little bit of a lesson on the thing that I played at the beginning, which was kind of a that's all right, mama kind of thing, you know, which is just based on uh, playing, you know, two different forms of, of G. Uh, so you have your, your normal bar shape like this, and then you have this, which is kind of like a C shape, and I'm hitting this high uh, D note with my, uh, with my pinky. So you have... Uh, then you have, you know, of course, a normal kind of C, C7. And I just, you know, m move it down a fret and kind of, and kind of walk it up. And then I play this kind of sixth shape and, and bend it. the whole thing and then back to the the first one and, and, and instead of playing kind of a, a g7 you play kind of more maybe more of a g6 and then comes some kind of pat grogan uh uh little licks i learned from pat grogan now i might have shown these before but uh And that's starting on the A string. You're just hammering on, on the uh, on the fourth fret, and then using your your two fingers here to uh, to hit those other notes open. And then hit that high G. Then you slide up. So again, the, and then you slide up to the seventh fret and that's that. All right, guys. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode talking about the flood and uh, just the, the insanity of that. And I hope you've, uh, yeah. And, and thank you to everyone that's uh, supported the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. And guys, if you've bought a t-shirt or a mug or a hat, please send me a picture of you with it. And, uh, and I'll uh, start uh, adding it on to the end of the episodes, so, you know, just to say thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.